wonderful or if things are challenging, uh, every week we strive to help make life just a bit better. Uh, my name is Dan Lerner. And I'm Dr. Alan Schlechter. And together over the past eight years, we have taught the science of happiness to over 6,000 students at New York University. Um, the Happiest Hour Live came about in great part because of these students, uh, some of whom might be here today, we certainly hope. Uh, just last month, we were teaching our first Zoom class for NYU for Science of Happiness. There was so much wonderful interaction, uh, and so many students were asking if they could gather more often that Al and I decided it would be really helpful and really meaningful uh, and a lot of fun to share it with a broader audience. So with the generous support of the Crane Center for Mindful Living, each week we um, invite a renowned expert in an area of, uh, of well-being, uh, an author, uh, to discuss how you might live a more fulfilling life. Uh, and this show, by the way, to be really clear, is about you. You as an individual, you as a community, uh, you seeking to live a more fulfilling life. So while we're gonna kick it off, Alan and myself and our guest, uh, the chat box is open. And we invite you to chat with one another. We invite you to ask any questions, chat with us. If we can answer them right there, we will. Ask questions when you'd like. We, we tend to have conversation for the first 30 minutes or so um, and then go to Q&A, but it's wide open. We just like to think about this like a big kind of gathering. Um, so uh, speaking of needs, by the way, uh, while we are so happy to be able to bring the show to you free of charge, uh, we encourage you to uh, donate uh, to No Kid Hungry. Uh, we have a link to that, we, uh, and we'll share that at the end of the show um, to help, some, help the less fortunate, especially right now. But speaking of helpful and meaningful and fun, uh, we have an amazing guest this week. Uh, I met Emily Esfahani-Smith. Uh, well, I didn't so much meet her as I did a, admire her from afar. Uh, it was my first year on the teaching staff at, in the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, there was this student, and every time she spoke in class, something brilliant and insightful and moving would emerge. And um, every time uh, she wrote a paper, uh, I would actually, something brilliant and insightful and moving would emerge. And I find myself sitting there going, maybe she could read my papers and tell me what I could do to be a better writer because it was remarkable. And then I finally got to meet her and uh, not so surprising that when we, uh, when we met, she was all of that. She was uh, brilliant and insightful and moving and so, so, so much more. So I'm thrilled to be able to, to invite her and, ha and, and, and share this with you and uh, Alan and I both are. Uh, but Emily has, uh, is really remarkable. So that brilliant, insightful, moving person has done some brilliant, insightful, moving things. She is a writer, she's an editor, she um, is a speaker, she's based in Washington, DC. Uh, she draws on psychology, philosophy, literature to write about the human experience. Uh, why we are the way we are, and how we can find grace and meaning in a world that's full of suffering. And one might say, especially right now. Um, her book, her wonderful book, The Power of Meaning, is an international bestseller. It's been translated into 16 different languages. Um, she's a former editor of The New Criterion, uh, and her articles and essays have appeared in The New York Times, uh, The Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, and other publications. Uh, there was a wonderful uh, um, article by Emily, I, I want to say it's no more than a week ago uh, in the New York Times, an op-ed about meaning, which we'll be talking about today. But she's been on uh, NBC's Today Show, uh, CBS This Morning, NPR, clearly getting ready for her big moment on The Happiest Hour Live. And in 2019, uh, she was appointed journalism fellow at Yale University. She speaks, she writes, uh, she is everywhere. And today, uh, we're, we're so thrilled to have her here. So to welcome a friend and a, and a really uh, remarkable human being, it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome Emily to the happiest hour. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thanks for having me. It's so good to be here with you. And I, you know, I remember very well the comments that you left me on my papers when, when you were grading them and how um, helpful they were. So it's fun to have my memory jogged about that. Wow, we, we have such different experiences, Emily. Uh, <laughs> because when I was writing with Dan, uh, I would have to hold on to the chair uh, before I opened my paper, like anything I had written. Um, and, and I would just have a box of tissues. Um, and I would, it was, I'm actually still in a recovery group. <laughs> but I'm glad to see you had a different experience. <laughs> Um, so we, we often uh, start this show by asking a question to everyone who's with us, uh, which is, what would you like out of your 
happier, happiest hour. What, what, what would you like out of the next hour? Why is everyone logging on? Um, and if you can open up your chat box and send a message, anyone, if you want to type, let's see what people are gonna say. I'm gonna, I'm gonna post something up there. Um, here you go. Shows Zach Zeta right now, what would the outcome be? Interaction, wonderful, right? Positive. NTCEP, I often write inspiration as well. Uh, I think. More positively. Inspiration. There's some, certainly some themes emerging. Emily, what are you seeing? And Grace Darren. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think as I'm watching these responses come in, I think that um, there are a few themes that I'm seeing come up again and again. Um, one, one is like you noticed too, Alan, inspiration. And I think that that makes sense right now, just given how hard things are and how um, dire the news is um, and, and how that can make people feel a bit uncertain. I can understand why people are looking for somebody to kind of lift them up. Along a similar line, the second theme I noticed is um, ways to be more positive. And I think, again, like it's so easy to get mired in negative thinking, given everything that's happening, given the uncertainty, all the losses people are experiencing, all the fear. Um, so those two things I kind of feel like are in the same bucket. Another is a desire for kind of connection and interaction. Um, and then resilience, you know, how can we be stronger in the face of hard circumstances? Um, what can the science teach us about how to find meaning during hard times? So we, meaning is, can feel like one of the more amorphous topics uh, that, that we've talked about so far. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be harder for some people to understand just how concrete it can be and what an amazing resource. And in a way, I don't know if you call it a tool. Um, and so I was hoping you could kind of tee off today's talk by, by just kind of giving people, you've done such an amazing job of making meaning more accessible to people. So maybe you could just talk about that for a moment, Emily. Absolutely. And, and I agree. I, I, I agree that meaning can be really amorphous. And we often use the term meaning interchangeably with the word happiness, with the word purpose. Um, and so I think it's, it is really important to get clear on what it means. And I, I think for me, what helps me the most was when I came across the book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor. Really good, you know, short little book, highly recommend it to everyone here. And, you know, Frankel um, was a Jewish psychiatrist living in Vienna when the Nazis came to power. And um, I think in 1941 or 42, he and his family, including his wife who was pregnant and his parents were taken uh, to a Nazi concentration camp. And, you know, three years later, four years later when the war ended, he, he had survived, but his, his family had died. And he wrote this book within a year of being released from the camp. And it was all about his experiences in the camp and what he saw there. And what he saw was that, you know, there are some people there, some prisoners uh, who gave up, you know, they gave up hope and that's completely understandable. It was really horrendous circumstances, nightmarish. They'd lost everything. Some of them had watched family members perish in the gas chambers. Um, so it's understandable to kind of feel despair. Um, given all that. But then there were others who continued to believe that their lives were meaningful in some way. And they, those who did, um, he found were like much more resilient in the face of suffering. And there's a ton of kind of modern psychology research that supports that, you know, what he kind of found more anecdotally. And he gives us, he gives a couple of examples that I think make, make this really concrete. He talks about two um, suicidal inmates who he, counseled, who he counseled there. And for both men, he said, getting them to change their perspective on whether life was worth living was a matter of getting them to identify what their purpose was. And once he was able to do that, 
things changed for them. So for one, it was the prospect of reuniting with his son who was living in refuge elsewhere in Europe. For the other, who was a scientist, it was um, the, the hope of getting to once again work on this publication, this book manuscript that he had begun uh, before he was taken away. And, and so Frankel said, and he, he, he was paraphrasing Nietzsche, he said, you know, what I found was that those who knew the why of their existence uh, can withstand almost any how. And I, I thought, I think the reason why Frankel's work really um, resonated with me is because I think that for so many people, I mean, people, of course, we're like all suffering now, but um, you know, as the Buddhists say, like life in general is is suffering. It's hard. It's stressful. Um, you know, somebody said something here about like how how do you, Kevin like dealing with anxious thoughts is, is why is why he's here. And so I think all of us, in good times and in bad, are dealing with things. And meaning is really a bomb. It's something that can kind of carry us through. You know, before you were talking, Alan, about how before we all got on this and we were talking privately about how meaning is like a life preserver. It helps us float through all this good and the bad. And so I think that perspective really helped me see concretely what meaning was and, um, and why it mattered. Oh, that was wonderful. Yeah, really beautiful. Yeah. You know, I'm curious, I mean, you, you know, you, you brought up a word that I, I wanted to ask about earlier on and you, you, you talked about purpose mm -hmm. uh, specifically that you, you, using that word uh, with Frankel. Can you, can you talk a little bit about meaning and purpose, or they're, they're, how they relate to one another? Yeah, definitely. And um, and as I was kind of talking about that, I, I had this kind of footnote where I wanted to come back to it. So thank you for, for saying that. So meaning, the way that I kind of understand it, based on what psychologists and philosophers, um, thinkers, great thinkers, modern thinkers, old thinkers have, have said, is it's really about um, connecting and contributing to something beyond yourself. Um, so it's this kind of broader category. And there are lots of different ways that we can do that, where we can like connect and contribute to something bigger than ourselves. Um, and purpose is one of them. In my book, I talk about four different ways, um, these four different pillars of meaning, um, which, you know, if you want that, you know, if meaning is the broader category, these pillars are what kind of support a meaningful life. And so purpose is one of them. The other three are belonging, transcendence, and storytelling. But purpose, as I said a second ago, it does get used interchangeably with meaning, but it's, it's, it's something more specific. Purpose is like a goal or a principle uh, that organizes your life or the particular tasks that you're doing and involves making a contribution to others. Uh, so, so the psychologist William Damon at Stanford who um, has done a lot of research among young people and young adults, how they find their purpose. He says that purpose has to be um, meaningful to the self and meaningful to society. And I think one thing that's important to understand about purpose is that it can feel really big, like meaning itself. And a lot of people think, oh, I have to find my capital P purpose in order to have a purpose in life. Uh, but when I kind of spoke to people about, you know, interviewed people about their lives, looked at the research, I found actually that people conceive of purpose in all kinds of ways. I mean, some people do have that kind of grand purpose. Maybe they, you know, are in college, want to go to med school because they want to find a cure for cancer. But a lot of people, like the purpose is much more local. You know, you know like all the parents I talked to pretty much said, like, my purpose, one of my purposes is raising my children. Um, I talked to this woman who worked in a hospital, and I think this is a really relevant example for now. She was a custodian, and she was part of this bigger study that um, some researchers at the University of Michigan uh, and Yale were doing about meaning at work. And so she's a hospital cleaner. What, what is she actually doing day to day? She's mopping the floors. She's cleaning bedpans. Um, but she said that her purpose isn't just to clean up. It's to help sick people heal. So um, there's all kinds of different ways to think about your purpose. Um, but it, it, you know, it basically involves like, I think another way to think about it is it's, it's about having something worthwhile to do with your time. So when you look at how you're spending your time, does it connect to something bigger that matters to you and to the world? The, yeah, I, I was thinking of talking about this later, but I keep thinking about it. Uh, a thing Dan and I talked about before which is I, I work with kids. And when I say to them, what do you want to do when you grow up? They, the answer has shifted 
And now everyone wants to be a professional video game player. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the challenges right now is, uh, I think that generationally we're having is I think a lot of kids find online experiences extremely meaningful. And mm -hmm. I think they see their purpose there almost. But I think many of us look and we go, that's not meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, and using your four pillars, is there a way of helping yourself understand whether something really is meaningful? You know, and, and by the way, just, just, get, just to uh, fill this in a little bit, uh, or add to it, not fill it in, but add to it. So you know, when, uh, when we teach uh, flow in class, we talk about junk flow. Right, yeah. Alan, this port is portion of the uh, of the class, and so you know, junk flow means you know you get for folks out there the idea of flow or being in the zone is you know you're doing something you're super engaged, and all of a sudden, boom, it's three hours later, you haven't heard the phone ring, you've been so locked in, and um, and you usually finish and you go, that was that was that was great. You might not feel it in the moment, but you, you merge going, oh, that was really worthwhile. When you, you know, when you watch The Office for five hours in a row, you know, you don't, you don't finish, you're like, oh, where'd the time go? That was amazing. I'm so glad I did that. Look at me. I just watched a lot of television. Um, so there's that junk flow question. Uh, and are video games flow or junk flow? And now this question on meaning uh, seems, to, seems to resonate the same way, right? Yeah, sure. no, definitely. I mean, I think, I guess the way that I would make sense of that is, um, there is, look, I'm not, I don't play video games at all, so I don't want to dismiss what might be an actual, actually like a really meaningful experience because I just have no experience at all with it. Um, but I will say, you know, to the point of like watching The Office for five hours, um, that, you know, that's, I've been, you know, maybe not for five hours, but I've been in like a situation like that where I leave and I'm just like, that was a waste of time, even though it was like engaging me kind of. I think that the experiences, that, that one way that you can identify whether a, an experience is truly meaningful is if it kind of takes you outside of yourself in a way that is um, ennobling or elevating. Um, in other words, it like brings you to a higher state of who you are. It kind of, um, it, it, it induces growth maybe. Um, I think those authentic flow experiences you know, for me anyways, you know, often I, it's, it's in my writing where I get there, it's kind of like, I know that Chick Sentmahai talks about it in terms of like where your ability meets your, um, uh, where the challenge meets your ability or something like that. Um, and, and I think that's, that's definitely true, but I think also like one way that I've experienced it is where actually like my ability is being pushed so that I'm like growing while I'm at the same time kind of meeting the challenge. And so there's that part of it where like there's something more that's coming out of it and that's kind of bringing me into a higher state. So that's, that's one way I would think about it if that's, if that's helpful. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, Dan, I know you have a young child, Alan, you work with kids, like does that if you give some kind of response to counter this claim that, you know, online stuff is not so meaningful, how do they take that? Uh, actually, I think you just articulated something for me that has been uh, in my head for such a long time. I mean, junk flow activities uh, increase apathy. Um, mm -hmm. And somebody asked for mm -hmm. the study and I, I can get that to you. Um, and, and so that's one way of looking at it. But I think, where meaning and flow intersect, there is going to be tremendous growth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that way, I mean, meaning is such a phenomenal um, growth agent. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a wonderful way you just put it. Yeah, this, this I, I gotta say, I think that this, this uh, I'd love to hear from, from folks who are here on what they find meaningful. Yeah, you know, if if you could feel comfortable sharing that, and, and a few people shared, you know, Alan, you, uh, Brandel, you shared how you're thinking about it. A couple of folks uh, mentioned some things, but for people who are right there, I mean, wh what do you find meaningful right now? And if not now, um, not to, uh, if not now, like when was the time in your life uh, when things felt really meaningful for you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, just as those um, answers come in, I'm seeing just a question from Sydney Rubin. Hi, Sydney. Um, I, um, she asks, like, she's read articles where meaning is broken down into purpose, coherence, and mattering. Um, is this the latest thinking? And yeah, so what, like in the kind of academic literature, um, they talk about meaning in terms of, you know, feeling like having three dimensions, feeling like your life is significant um, or has value. Um, feeling like your life has a purpose um, or like some aim that drives it and then feeling like your life is coherent. So I think that, you know, the mattering, the, the, the framework that Sydney cited is, is kind of on par with that. And this is the work of Michael Steger, um, who's kind of the, one of the leaders in, in meaning research. Yeah. Um, and, and my, I kind of, you know, took those ideas and with my pillars, I'm kind of like getting at it in a different way, I would say, but I'm, that it's, I'm, I'm trying to kind of, you know, be true to that understanding of meaning. So what is, so what is coming up here for folks? I mean, knowing you're making a contribution, development to something, uh, or development of something, right? Friends and family, uh, spending hours talking to the people. Right. Helping people with disabilities, being a good friend for friends in need, right? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Theodora just said, I felt meaning at my job working with little kids, I miss them. I I'm curious, Emily, what do you see as the barriers for people? There, there are the concrete barriers if I can't get to the kids I work with, but mm -hmm. what are the barriers of connecting with your meaning right now in this mm -hmm. moment in history? Mm -hmm. So certainly um, what's happening you know, in the world of work, you know, some people, some people can, you know, transition seamlessly to a work from home situation. Um, I am one of them just because of writing. It's, it's not, I don't necessarily have to interact with anyone when I'm doing that. Obviously, some of the speaking and these kinds of activities um, are different. But, you know, um, if you kind of take, you know, people who do derive meaning from like the actual connections that they um, are having on a daily basis or like that the contributions, seeing the results of those, um, I can see how that would be a barrier. Some, some people have just lost their jobs or they've been furloughed. And so, you know, work as a source of meaning and how, how this time is um, truncating our ability to fully engage with work. I think that's one barrier. Um, and, you know, I think it hits on, you know, purpose and belonging because oftentimes we experience belonging through work and also that's where our purpose gets played out. Um, I think another thing hits on, you know, coherence, which Sydney mentioned, or what I call storytelling, which is how we make sense of what's going on around us, what's the story that we're telling. Um, in times of uncertainty, our stories get really shaken up. You know, we might have had a narrative that like the world is a safe place. My life is moving in a certain direction. I'm thinking right now of like college seniors, for example, um, you know, and, and I have this like entire future ahead of me. And now, you know, graduation has been canceled. A lot of them, have, you know, don't have jobs that they thought they would have to, to move into. Maybe they're moving at home with their parents, which is not what they had in mind for that, you know, first year of true adulthood. Um, and so there's kind of this break in people's stories. And so how do you... Um, like, how do you begin to rewrite that story to reconceive of like what your narrative is about like where the world is right now? So that's, that's another one that I, I, I see and have been thinking about a lot. Uh, a lot of people are actually bringing up their kids right now as mm -hmm. sources of meaning. And particularly for those of us with young kids, I think what's really tricky is it's not only my story but I'm trying to help my kids and all the kids that I work with mm. uh, rewrite their stories. And so I would really love, <laughs> how do you help other people rewrite their stories? Mm. How do you do I that? Mean, you know, as a psychiatrist, like that's like, you know, that's, that's the hard, that, that's like really hard work as I'm sure, as I'm sure you know. And so I feel a little sheepish, um, you know, giving you kind of pointing to anything to you, but I'll just say what I kind of found um, that was helpful. I think, um, and this is from the research, and I would say it's also just from like my experience with, you know, friends who are telling a bad story or, or you know, people that I love. I think that a lot of times, um, well, I'll begin by saying, 
that we know from psychology research that human beings have a really strong negativity bias. So that when bad things are happening, it's much more likely to um, get kind of embedded into our minds and therefore into our stories. And we get so focused on the bad that we overlook the good. So in relationships, for example, if, um, if you want to have a happy relationship, they say you have to have five good things happen for each one bad thing because the, the bad can like so poison the well that you need five good things to kind of undo that. Um, so, so then what that means with our stories is that like we're much more disposed to telling stories that incorporate this kind of negative view of the world. And it's not a realistic story because there's actually all these good things that are happening that we're not as aware of or aren't penetrating us the way the bad does. And so when I think about how to get people or how you can get yourself to rewrite your story, I would say like, look for the good, look for the positive um, and don't discount it. Like people say, oh, is this just Pollyanna-ish thinking? But no, it's not. It's actually more realistic thinking because our, our brain bias is to kind of take us in the negative. That's the unrealistic thinking. So I would say, so there's two, there's two things that I would say. One is look for the positive, make sure that you incorporate that into your story. And the second is if you're telling a really negative story about yourself, like if you're saying things like, you know, my, like, this is awful. I, you know, my graduation was canceled. I'm never going to get a job. This is going to set me back economically, you know, for years. And there's kind of new stories that are talking about this. Um, you know, I would ask yourself, like, is, you know, what evidence do you have um, to, to back up those claims, you know, that you're, you're catastrophizing? Um, and is there, is there evidence? I mean, I graduated into the recession of 2008, 2009, and everybody said how, like, life for millennials then was going to be ruined. And actually, like, you know, millennials are doing really well. Like, they, they're saving money that the research is showing. They're, like, you know, they're, 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 they're more prudent with their money, but like things are going okay. So, um, you know, asking yourself, like, what is the evidence for these beliefs? Am I justified in kind of catastrophizing the way that I am? Mm. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, you're talking about, um, it's almost like you're finding such a beautiful way to take things like thinking traps and cognitive biases uh, and be able to reshape them so they're not like mechanisms, but they are stories, right? I mean, you as a writer, and I'd love to get to this in a moment too, uh, you know, one of the things I, I've always appreciated about your work is you can take science and you can uh, research and make it beautiful and you can make it um, engaging and you, can, and you can bring it to life because there are, there are human beings in, your, in the way you write. And so rather than, you know, Often you can say, well, this is not, this is not a mad thought. It's catastrophizing. You can say, let's talk about graduating in 2008. Let's talk about where we are right now with, with the pandemic. Uh, for all of us, and clearly, and Alan and I are particularly close to this, uh, seniors in, uh, in high school, college who are, as you said, no graduation, no nothing. So, so um, you can say you're going to catastrophize. But to say, listen, I'm going to share a story with you. It was 2008. And we were coming out and no one was, it was supposed to be ruined for everybody. And let me tell you about what actually transpired. Uh, it's such a beautiful way to share this work and it makes it so much more accessible a la, um, a la Victor Frankl, right? A la uh, Anne Frank, um, you know, and people who've really suffered. You read it and these things, when you, when you see other people being able, how they manage, uh, it's so much more tangible uh, than it is when it's just, here's a, re here's a bit of research. You know, and, and you talk, you, you talk to that in your book so beautifully in terms of your upbringing and your mm -hmm. background. I wonder if you could say a few words about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, I just, I really do believe in the power of story, not just as to kind of bring meaning into your own life as you figure out what your, your story is and, and understand that you have the ability to change it. Um, you know, somebody commenting, Annika says that, you know, she's thinking, she was thinking about herself as like just someone who's not hireable rather than seeing that this is just like a really crazy time and everyone's being affected. So we all have this ability to kind of edit our stories, retell it, reinterpret it. A lot of times we don't realize that. Um, so just kind of realizing that I think is really empowering. Um, and, and for me, you know, my story, when I think about how I came to writing about what I'm writing about and, and becoming interested in the things that I'm interested in, I look back, you know, with storytelling, what you're really asking is like, 
who am I, where did I come from, where am I going? And for me, where I came from, I, um, I grew up in downtown Montreal and my parents administered a Sufi meeting house from our home. Um, so, you know, the main floor of our home, so Sufism, I should say, for those who might not know, um, is a school of mysticism that's associated with Islam. The poet Rumi was a Sufi. Um, the whirling dervishes are Sufis. So it's this kind of um, spiritual practice, very centered on meditation, contemplative practices, um, very mystical in orientation. Um, and so growing up in the meeting house um, was probably the closest analogy I can think of um, that you know would resonate maybe with this audience is it was like living um, in a Buddhist Sangha. There was um, on the main floor of our home, um, there were no you know couches or anything like that. There was just kind of cushions on the floor. People would come twice a week in the evenings for several hours and they would meditate. And um, the purpose of their practice was to kind of reach beyond themselves, like step outside of what spiritual leaders think of as the false self, the small self, the, the part of us that's really focused on, you know, our anxieties, like, oh my God, like what's gonna happen? Oh my God, am I good enough? Like, am I gonna make enough money? Like, you know, these kinds of things that take up our day-to-day -day life um, and to connect with something higher, like to get in touch with um, the trans a, a transcendent source of meaning, which, you know, Sufis think of as God, other people might think of as nature, universal consciousness, things like that. So, you know, I was surrounded by people who um, were leading, had pretty, you know, were leading meaningful lives, had a pretty clear sense of what gave their lives meaning. Uh, and I think that kind of, that stayed with me, um, that, uh, that example that they left for me. And it was interesting, I mean, and I think a big part of it too was that that was occurring for them having those questions answered was within a religious and spiritual context. Um, so that when I, when we ended up leaving the city meeting house and moving here to the States, and then when I went to college um, in a much more secular environment, I really began to wonder, you know, is it possible to find meaning outside of a religious context? What does that look like? Um, and that ultimately led me to, to studying like philosophy and, and positive psychology, because it was kind of answering those you know, fundamentally philosophical and religious questions, I would say, but in like a secular way using, using the science. So positive psychology, right? Um, you know, we had a couple of questions here, people asking about, because you, you had brought up to a retelling story um, and uh, focusing on, on good. What is, what is happening that can focus on what's going well? I wonder if you can say a few things, uh, if you can get a bit gran more granular on that. Right, uh, for the folks who are asking, and I, I think they ask not, not for the, only themselves, but for many people here, especially right now. Uh, I guess part of it would be, how do you do that? And I'd be curious too right now, because it's awkward, right? It can be awkward right now. Should mm -hmm. I really be finding good things out there? This is a really challenging time. Like what's realistic and what's, what's, what's unrealistic optimism or unrealistic positive you know, thought? Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we find that, do you think? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I mean, I mentioned Frankel earlier, and I'll, I'll mention him again. He has this idea um, in Man's Search for Meaning of tragic optimism. Uh, and, and the idea is that, you know, life is really hard. It's full of suffering, um, full of loss. And yet, in spite of that, it's still possible to find meaning, um, to find the good. I think he puts it in a way like this, where he says, you know, you can con construct something positive despite all the negative. Um, so I think that's helpful because it acknowledges that there is a lot of suffering. And so you don't want to whitewash it. You don't want to, as you say, like kind of awkwardly deny the, the gravity of what's happening. Um, but it, it's still possible to find something positive. Um, and I think What's, what's, what might be helpful to, to understand too is that in the research on resilience, who is most resilient in the face of crises and, and also as, as a separate matter, who grows after a crisis? Um, the answer is that it's people who are able to find some kind of meaning um, in what's happening. Psychologists call this benefit finding, which is a phrase I don't really love because it, you know, it does sound a little bit dismissive of the hardship, but when you look more closely and you, um, you kind of ask these people who are resilient, 
you know, what are you feeling? What are you finding? It turns out that they experience just as much, if not more, of the negative of what's happening. So they're just as despairing and anguished um, as the people who are less resilient, but they're also able at the same time to kind of keep some space for the good. So it's almost like their emotional reaction isn't um, to whitewash the bad, it's, 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 it's a more complex emotion. It's to kind of contain both the good and the bad. Um, and there was a study that, that um, was conducted after 9-11 that I think illustrates this in a more concrete way where um, the researchers followed, I think it was a group of recent college grads or, or college age people um, after 9-11 um, for a few weeks. And what they found was that the people who were more resilient, again, like they experienced as much negative emotions as the less resilient people, but they also reported um, experiencing more, more um, encounters and experiences of love and gratitude, um, these kind of more positive emotions, positive experiences. And so I think, I, I, I don't really know if, if people kind of deliberately do this, where it, it's kind of a coping mechanism where things are hard and so they, are specifically looking for the positive, or it's just like a natural way that some people respond um, that, that others have a harder time doing. I, I wanna go back to something you mentioned before that's still been uh, in my head and I've been puzzling it out. You know, I love your story of your connection to Sufism and how that brought you to meaning and and you mentioned nature along the way. And I also have a real connection to my uh, Judaism and, and lighting candles on Friday night on Zoom call uh, with my family. And that's been really meaningful. Um, Your mother's here today, by the way. I saw, and, I saw and, and my mother is here. Well, Mr. Schlechter, it's good to see you. I know. And we had the first one of these on the first night of Passover. And the matzo ball soup was a little hot. We were in some hot matzo ball soup that night. Um, but uh, I wonder, could you say why nature, or if you've read anything, why is nature so meaningful uh, and connecting with nature uh, so meaningful yeah. to people? So one of, one of the pillars that I write about is transcendence. And that's a big word. Um, and maybe I should have found like a better word. But basically what what that is, is, is these experiences where you encounters with awe and beauty, um, where you feel like you're lifted out of that small self space that I was talking about earlier and are connected with something that's at a higher plane, that's kind of mysterious. And, you know, a, one portal to that is religion, spirituality, you know, another portal that a lot of people um, experience transcendence through is nature. Um, so getting outside, and there's like a really rich tradition um, in American philosophy of this with the transcendentalists, people like Henry David Thoreau, mm -hmm. um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, where they talk about nature as this kind of spiritual force that can take us outside of ourselves. Emerson talked about how, you know, when he goes on walks, when he would go on walks in the woods, he felt like a transparent eyeball. Um, in other words, like his, the boundaries of the self were dissolving and all he really was with it was this thing that was kind of like perceiving um, the beauty around him, but wasn't like separate from it. Um, and so I think nature has an ability to do that. I think part of why it can do that is because it's so grand and big and, and can make us aware of our own smallness. Um, and that can be like a terrifying realization. Um, you know, the word awe, has the same root as, as, the, as the word awful. Um, so it can be really terrifying to kind of come into contact with um, how puny we are. But, but people who have these kind of transcendent experiences in nature also say that even though they felt so small, these experiences were among the most meaningful ones of their lives because even though they felt small, they also felt connected to something much bigger and more mysterious. Um, so I think there's, there's that kind of paradox there that nature can take us outside of ourselves to make us feel connected to something so small, even while making us feel um, the, kind of the puniness of our existence. Emily, you just like exploded my head. That was so, uh, but that connection between the awe and the awful, for, for me, just sitting on a beach 
uh, and looking at the ocean has always been for me a great way to connect with something greater because I'm also a little scared of it. Mm -hmm. um, it was, um, it's, the ocean is frightening to me a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but it, it also fills me with something else and, and that connection with those two things and how we connect with transcendence that way is such an interesting idea. Something that big too, by the way, you know, brings me to mind a passion. And you know, I love the research on passion, Alan. And you know, um, whenever I talk, whenever I teach passion, talk about passion, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's love. It's something that we're compelled to do this wonderful. And sometimes someone will raise their hand. I mean, someone will always get to the idea of what if it's a passion for something negative? And every once in a while, someone will go, well, the passion of, you know, in the Bible is actually a really painful thing. Mm. Right. So knowing that it comes from this, this really this suffering, but also offers this opportunity. It's sort of, uh, as you said, with the ocean, it's so gorgeous. And that there's a little something there because it's so un un incomprehensible in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I think incomprehensible is a really good word in this context, because I think like part of what makes, um, you know, things that evoke transcendence in us, whether it's nature or religion, um, so meaningful is because they do, it, it kind of acknowledges something that I think a, a lot of people today don't want to acknowledge or, or haven't really thought about, which is that there is like a dimension of existence that is um, incomprehensible and mysterious. Um, you know, there, I mean, there are a lot of like really renowned scientists who even talk about this, like um, Richard Dawkins about like the sense of awe, um, you know, Einstein talked about this as well. And so, um, so I think that we live in a world where people think that science has given us all the answers, but then there are these experiences of transcendence that people have that reveal to them some kind of plane of existence um, that they, they describe as more real than reality itself, but it's not something that you can like touch and feel. And so um, I think for a lot of people, there's comfort in that because then they see, well, maybe there's something more here um, that redeems some of what I'm going through right now that can feel so hard. I mean, I'll, I'll just mention a story of, of a woman who I interviewed who, um, her name was Janine, and she received a diagnosis of terminal cancer, um, I think when she was in her 60s. And um, it was terrifying for her. She didn't have any kind of religious framework. And, and so suddenly she's faced with the fact that she's going to die. And she, she had no way of kind of making sense of that or finding peace in that. Well, one day she saw this flyer for a study um, that was being conducted at Johns Hopkins on psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. Um, and the study was all about how um, a transcendent experience induced by this particular agent um, would make people feel in the face of death. So it was a study of terminal, um, terminal cancer patients and how um, what transcendence would do to them. Well, um, she told me that when she, she ended up being in the experimental group, not the control condition, and she told me that um, there was something about that experience that completely changed her perspective on death. Um, and she, the, the way the researchers set up the experiment was after they gave the people the drug, um, they then put put them in a room with headphones on where um, they listened to music that was meant to kind of track the um, the high and, and the low of the experience that they were going through. And Janine said that there was this one point in, um, in that recording where the music was crescendoing at the same time that her feeling of transcendence was peaking. And it was, she felt her breath kind of rising and moving in rhythm with the music. And finally, when the music reached its peak, um, she, she held her breath and she realized in that moment that it was okay to stop breathing. Um, so at that peak, like there, she was able to kind of let go of that um, fear of death and she emerged from that experience really feeling at peace. And she's told me that the reason was she came into contact with something mysterious, ineffable. She couldn't describe it in words and feeling like her life was part of that made her feel like things don't just end with death. There's something life continues in some way, um, even if it's like my body disintegrating and then coming back, you know, th through the soil, through trees or whatever, there's something more and I'm part of that. 
that's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, that was wonderfully said. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's you. You bring up another well, a related pathway, and Emily, you and I have talked about this. By the way, I should just uh, sort of give give some props here to someone who's not here, which is uh, if 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 people are curious about things like psilocybin and and um, and uh, and ex these kind of experiences uh, and a range of experiences, um, transcendence and the like. Uh, our very good friend David Yaden uh, just began working at, at Johns Hopkins on the psilocybin um, research. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been interested in uh, transcendence, death, and, uh, and um, psychedelic experience since we've known him. I mean, I met him in 2012, you met him in 2013, Emily, and we're, we've, all been, we've all been friends ever since. He has some really interesting work out there. So Y-A-D-E-N, if you're curious, look up David Yaden. It's, it's a fascinating resource. Um, Emily, you, know, you, you mentioned, and this clearly is personal for me, and I, I imagine the other folks here will, will it'll resound for them, no pun intended, um, music, right? Yeah. Music is a pathway. I mean, there, there, there are clearly lots of different pathways. <clears throat> music and the arts seem to be one as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, for me, it's, it's always a big part of that has been uh, often there no, because there are no words, right? So you're left to be able to communicate in a way where you're not being told what to think, but rather you are communicating with somebody else. And when it, when, uh, I, by the way, I grew, I grew up in, the, in a family of musicians. My parents were both professional musicians, as you know, uh, classical musicians. My father was in the Pittsburgh Symphony. My mom was an opera singer. So I was, I grew up around people who really valued music in a very, very deeply and very meaningfully. Um, so there's something on music where I can get lost. I lose track of time. I've had transcendent moments. Probably my most transcendent moments, many of them have been while experiencing music. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, about creativity and transcendence? Mm -hmm. um, whether it's visual, uh, auditory, um, what have you found in, in your writing, in, in, your, in your research? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, the arts are absolutely um, a way that people can experience transcendence. And I think, um, so with creativity, I mean, I think there are kind of two sides to it. One is like if you're the person who's, you know, consuming the creativity, you're listening to a piece of music, you're, you're viewing a, a work of art. And I think that um, it can evoke transcendence in two ways. One is just awe at the, um, at the achievement that somebody was capable of producing this, this phenomenal work of art, um, you know, awe of what human beings are capable of. Um, and I think the other is just like the emotion that the work of art itself um, elicits in you because it, it is rousing. Um, and I remember, I remember you talking, Dan, um, you gave a beautiful talk on music. And I can't remember if it was in class or, or a speaking retreat that we did together um, where you were saying um, how listening to a work of Johann Sebastian Bach brought you, made you feel much more connected to someone you loved who had passed away. But was it your, was it your mother? Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really beautiful story if, if, if you want to tell that. Um, but, the, but so like, I think that that's like another way, it kind of like, it takes us to a world that we don't necessarily expect to go to. Mm. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I, I agree. I mean, I'm happy to share the story. It's uh. Um, but I, I don't know if <laughs> now's the right time. Um, I guess, you know, in, in, in brief, the story was that, uh, how do I do this in, in shortened form? I was standing in the kitchen in, in New York in my old apartment uh, one day and uh, one evening and just listening to music. And I listened to a lot of Baroque music. It was my father's favorite. I grew up on Bach and Handel and <clears throat> all those kind of, uh, those old guys. And, uh, and I had just a random playlist going. And at one point, a piece came on and like, it was, a, it was, the room was dark and I was reading a magazine sort of with a little bit of light and it like shocked me. And I just heard these first notes and they were just super simple and I just froze. I was standing up, I froze. And um, as the song went on, I was, um, I started to cry and it was an incredibly simple song, and I and, and I started to cry harder, and then I was weeping by the end. And right before I knew it was going to be over, it's like a two and a half minute song uh, or piece, rather. I was just fully flooded in tears, and I dove over to my computer because it was on an a a Apple playlist to hit pause just to see what it was. And it was um, it was a piece by Bach, and I called my dad immediately, uh, 
and I, and I, and I said, listen to this. And my dad, Bach was his favorite composer. He said, um, Sweetheart, that's, that's, not, that's not Bach. I said, Dad, it says it right here, it's Bach. He's like, you know, Daniel, I, I know my Bach, that's not Bach, right? And I had everything in triplicate. I had everything he'd ever written, you know, grew up with it. And, uh, and I was like, fine. And I hung up and, and I started looking around for it and I couldn't find it, I couldn't find it. And I finally, I found it. It was over at the Lincoln Center Library and I went over to talk to my librarian and uh, she helped me find this piece. And um, it was entitled, and there are not many titles on a lot of Bach piano pieces, on the departure of his beloved brother. And it was um, written when Bach was very young, and he was 18, and his brother was about to go off to war. And it was pretty clear to me from this that he was afraid that he was going to lose him and never see him again. Mm -hmm. And it struck me when I realized, you know, what was it that moved me? That you know, My mother had passed, um, I can't remember, maybe, maybe a year before, six months to a year before. And it hit me in that moment that from 300 years ago, this man who I have nothing in common with, reached out across time and basically put his hand on my shoulder and said, you are not alone. Mm. Here is someone who heard me and who felt me. And I think for me, that was, it was one of the most extraordinary moments I've had of music. I've had other moments of music and I've, I think I've realized, oh, we kind of get each other. You're speaking mm. to me now. There's mm -hmm. a different language here that words wouldn't do justice to. And so that was, that was my experience uh, for sure. I, I, I take uh, great pleasure and um, I get teased by his mother, but uh, Julian, my son and I, you know, we cry a lot <laughs> when it comes to movies and particularly music. Uh, I'll find him crying over a piece and two of us will like be slumped over like weeping together. <laughs> and Aaron will be like, what's wrong with you guys? Mm -hmm. like, and that for us, that's the language. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's such a beautiful story. And I think like, it, yeah, it makes me think of two things. One, the point that you said about how music is particularly conducive to communicating the, the mysterious because it, there's, no, there's no language. There's no language there. And I think that there's something similar going on in meditation experiences in nature, that it's just pure being and coming into contact with that is really powerful. Um, and then the second thing with art is how it can make you feel less alone in the world. It kind of like, and I guess, I think stories are like this too. It, it like represents your own experiences back to you, but in a way that allows you to actually find more meaning in it. There's a lot of studies about how when people read um, novels or, or whatever, part of what they're doing is making meaning in, of their own lives while they're reading the story because they're kind of processing their own story through the story that they're reading. And you know, people say like, if you go back and you read a novel again and again over the years, what it what you, um, what you take away from it says more about like, where you are in your own life um, than what the novel's actual story is, because that remains static, but your experiences change. Yeah. You know, I wonder if I could just ask, just, just for a moment, if, if people feel comfortable doing so, I'd be curious to know what, um, what piece of creative, of cre of creative uh, anything, music, art, dance, um, uh, uh, writing, uh, poetry, is, is there something that stands out for someone here that, that a moment in their life uh, that brings them back to a particularly meaningful moment? Or it was a, it was a meaningful um, performance, it was a meaningful um, creation that spoke to them? While people are writing that, I'd just like to point out, uh, Dan, uh, what you brought up in the creativity and Emily, how you explained it uh, so wonderfully and Dan and your story. I think it's such a concrete exercise for all of us. Um, I have, as you were telling your story, Dan, uh, I was thinking something I've done since the beginning of this is I've taken out my father's old records. Mm. And, right. and that connection, my, my father is sadly not with us anymore. But when I'm listening to them and I'm thinking, he listened to these records. Mm -hmm. He heard the same story staticky chalky sound and music is still accessible to us uh and the idea of taking that time all of us can in any day experiencing the music sharing it with people we love is one way of creating some meaning right now mm -hmm. yeah, yeah and the, the connection that um that it brings so it's like the music isn't just 
um, an a way to experience transcendence, but actually, you know, belonging, like, a, you know, that, that feeling of not being alone, of feeling connected to someone that you lost or to, to another person who you're sending music to or whatever. I feel like they're like the friendships, like we all have the friendships that are, you know, they're, you know, especially intimate when you can just like send songs to one another. Cause it's like, you're sending a piece of your soul almost, you know, it's, it's so kind of deep and, and, and an intimate thing to do. I wonder if right now is actually a particularly, I mean, that's, that's a pathway that's available to a lot of us. Um, you know, someone uh, texted me privately, although I don't know if he meant to do it privately or not, but he wrote, um, cooking great meals that bring back memories. You know, everyone who's written something, well, I mean, someone wrote a performance at the Met, you know, we can go back and, 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 and find a video potentially of Jonas, Jonas Kaufman singing Parsifal at the Met. What is the book that meant something to you or that someone mentioned music that means something to you or records? We're not going anywhere right now. Mm -hmm. uh, to be able to find that experience, it's not like I won't be home in time, you know? Um, can we find a little time to like sit, even if it's for half an hour and just, I'm gonna go be with this now or, and actually share it, with, share it with our family. You know, the moment to say, let me tell you, I've told, I told Julian a few stories, uh, some of them are music based particularly to say, you know, let me tell you a story about this, this performance I saw and what happened afterwards. And, you know, and it was really, uh, it, was, it was a moment where we could come together over something meaningful too, because he's a, he's a young musician. And, you know, mm -hmm. so how can we relive these? It might be more available both for our time perspective and also because they're at our fingertips potentially. You know? Right, and, and Sidney Rubin just said, uh, he said, I feel like the loss of concerts in this pandemic is a huge loss. And it's true, you know, so much of what our talks have been about is, uh, it's the word I've been using again and again and again, is finding the, in this case, the micro meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you know we, we can't have the concerts, but I'm going to listen to a record mm -hmm. um, and share it uh, with my wonderful wife um and and my kids and i will have my micro dose of meaning right now mm -hmm. yeah, people are getting better at it too i gotta say i don't know if anyone caught the sondheim 90th birthday performances the other day but you know they're cobbled together i think it was i don't know i think it was meryl streep or somebody who had bas oh someone well known had basically a curtain behind her and you're like there's a curtain behind her right now like sewn together with paper clips or something um it didn't matter it was so wonderful and it's this live performance and you're not in the hall, you're not with other people. Um, but there is something about that that's people are trying to, to copy. Yeah, and of course, like there's those stories um, of people in Italy like singing to each other. Um, so there is, there, there's something about, and I think it's just so beautiful. I mean, it shows like the resilience of, of the human spirit and our yearning for, for meaning. And you know, you mentioned Alan that there are these kind of micro moments and I guess that was one of the things that surprised me most in like the research I did and the people I interviewed was that, you know, you think that it's like meaning is this big thing that you have to, you know, climb a mountaintop, go to a monastery, whatever to find. But actually like day to day, even when life is normal and it's not crazy and, and tragic the way it is now, I think what people do is like the way they find meaning is in these kind of local and little ways that, you know, on their own, might not seem like much, but when you add them together, they really, like, they can light up someone's life. Right, exactly. And, you know, it, it's such a beautiful way, I don't want to bring this to an end, but it's such a beautiful way to, to bring our hour to a close, to make things available, to think about things that we've had in our lives, think about ways we're sharing with people right now. While we not, might not, no one would choose to be in the situation, how do we find something meaningful in this situation? Yeah. Um, so, you know, but before I thank Emily, let me just sort of say to everyone here, uh, thank you for all coming. Um, next week, we are going to have, uh, and we, we've been so fortunate to have wonderful folks like Emily, who, who are so pertinent right now. Next week, we're going to welcome Jonathan Fields, who is uh, the founder of The Good Life Project. Uh, but also, he's written a number of books, including uh, Uncertainty, just called Uncertainty, and a book that's called uh, How to Live a Good Life. So it's going to be a really uh, timely discussion in terms of both the, the, wonder, one, the wonderful opportunities and the real challenges. Um, uh, keep your eyes peeled for an email about that. But also after this is done, if you stay on, we'll have a framed up um, 
uh, way to register. You can also go, and this just went live today, to www.thehappiesthour.org. Um, and we will have both recordings. So if you want to go back and catch Emily's and this, this whole conversation today, it should be up by Monday, I believe. But uh, last week, Scott Barry Kaufman and Corey uh, Mascara and Dan Tomasulo before. You can see that. And, and you can go ahead and donate through that page as well. You can also find the Crame Center, who, again, is so generous to, uh, to make this all possible. Um, so thank you, Emily, for being here today. It's been so special. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you guys, I really, really love the conversation. Loved hearing from, from everyone here in, in the chat box. Thanks to all who contributed. It, it was really special for me. Go, go out and find her book, uh, The Power of Being. It's really glorious. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us at the Happiest Hour. No matter where you are right now, things are wonderful. Uh, if things are challenging, we strive each week to make your life a little bit better. And we hope that you have a happier week. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.